Good evening. You know, my story is very unique um, to me, but it's one that is more and more common today. When I was a kid, never would my parents ever have imagined that I would one day be able to work in the White House, much less become a member of the United States Congress. My parents were immigrants from Mexico. My mom came to this country for a better life for her kids. And I was the youngest, as mentioned, of 11 kids. When I was growing up, my parents said to me, you're a doctor or a lawyer. That's the only way you're going to get out of this world, because we were poor. And when I see blood, I want to pass out. So I decided to go to law school. And I made it. My district, the 44th, goes from the Port of Los Angeles in San Pedro, all the way through Wilmington, Carson, Compton, Watts. It's very working class. Only 10% of students go on to college here. I'm one of the lucky 10%ers who beat the odds, who got a piece of the American dream, and then said, now's my chance to give back, to make sure that others have that same opportunity. And that's what I see in my role as a member of Congress, to give a voice to those who need it the most. But the path here was not easy. And it wasn't planned. As I said, I never dreamed I would run for Congress. Nowadays, I just read a study the other day that our kids at a very young age, by the time they're six years old, they're already falling into the stereotypes. And in this study, they asked kids, and they told them about people who were really, really great. And then they asked the kid if they thought it was a man or a woman. And I believe if it was the six-year-olds all identified with their own gender. So if it was a woman, it said, oh, it was a woman. If it was a man, it said that they were a man. But by the time the seven-year-olds, you did the same study, and they all reverted to saying they thought it was a man. So we see at a very early age at the impact that our stereotypes are playing on our kids. So let me tell you a little bit about my story that I started to tell you about, in particular about how I got to where I am. You know, I went to UCLA undergrad, and then I went to USC for law school. I came out with a ton of debt, and I decided at the time that there was just no way I could afford to do public interest work. And I got very lucky. As a UCLA undergraduate student, I got to work in the Clinton White House. And then I got to work on the Hill with the NAACP. I was just an intern. And I thought then, you know, if I work really hard, maybe I could come back one day and serve a president. Still not thinking that I might run one day. But I started practicing law, and seven years went by. I was very politically active behind the scenes, helping other people get elected. Still not thinking I would run. I decided to move to Florida to work on a presidential campaign, doing voter protection work, thinking, where can I apply my skills? And when I got home, I said, what can I do locally in my community? Now that I've paid down this debt, what could I do locally in my community? And I was flipping through the channels one day, and I saw a city council meeting. It was all men. There were no people of color. So I started to Google these guys. And I said, they're not that impressive. I could do that. And that is when I decided to run for city council. Now, at the time, there was an oil company that wanted to drill in a neighborhood and then out into the Santa Monica Bay. And I immediately took a position. And people said, what are you doing? You don't know which way the wind's blowing. And people also said, you can't win. Nobody knows who you are. You're not from around here. And they were true. The city I was running in, I wasn't from around there. Just to give you an idea, it was 80 6% Anglo, and about 5% Latino. And I said, you know what, my entire life, somebody's always telling me why I can't do something. You can't do something because your parents are immigrants, because you have no money. Whatever it was, somebody was always telling me that. So when I heard this, I said, you know what, I've heard this all my life. We'll see how it goes. And I worked really hard. Now, having worked in politics behind the scenes and helping other people get elected, I knew that it was going to take a lot of work. I knew I was going to have to knock on doors and raise money, and we did all that. 
I became the first woman in 10 years elected to the city council in Hermosa Beach, and the first Latina ever elected. And I spent my time there fighting this company, this oil company. It wasn't until after we beat this oil company that I started getting calls from people saying, we think you should consider running for Congress. And it was actually a member of Congress who called me and said, I've seen what you've done. This is a community where you grew up, where your family is. We need somebody who's going to make sure to give a voice to those who need it the most and to represent our community to be at the table. Because you know what they say, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And in this environment, today's day and age, isn't that so true? So I hung up the phone with the member, and I thought about it. I was, didn't take it very seriously at first, but then I looked at the numbers. Now, if you ever want to run for something, I highly recommend, there's a lot of women's ready to run programs, but Emily's List has something called the POP program, Political Opportunity Program. I did it before I ran for city council. What I really liked about it, it was a one day crash course, it was completely free, and it tells you what you need to do raise money, who you call, how to message. It was a real good crash course, and I encourage everybody to do it, the women, especially if you don't think you ever want to run. But let me tell you, when I was running for Congress, I did it the old-fashioned way. I knocked on doors. My district is 70% Latino, and you have never had a Latino representative in this district. You know, when I got into the race, people called and said, what are you doing? It's not your turn. Somebody else was promised a seat. And I said, you know what? I've heard this all my life. We'll see how it goes. Right? But I knocked on those doors. And one of the things that I really love is when I knock on the doors and I would, young kids would come out, seven, eight, nine. I would get down on a knee and I would say, what do you want to do when you grow up? And you would hear these kids say, I want to be a teacher or I want to be a beautician. And I would say, how about the President of the United States? You know, you could be the President of the United States one day. And you should just see their eyes light up and the big smile on their face. Nobody's ever told them that before. We need to tell that to every young person you see. You know that women need to be asked seven times to run before they run? And men wake up in the morning and say, I could be president of the United States today. It's a true story. So I take every moment I can to tell young Latinas, Latinos, boys and girls, that they could be whatever they want. I'm the prime example of that. You know, who could have ever imagined? And so, you know, I had a very tough congressional campaign. My opponent was handpicked. I wasn't supposed to win. The party was against me. The mayor was against me. The governor was against me. And I kept going. Now, I had to quit my job a year and a half out because I did it full time. I know that it's a little crazy. Sometimes people say, what would you do? But at the end of the day, I knew I was completely invested in it. And I don't, when I'm set out to do something, I put 110% in it, and I don't do it just to get my name out. I do it because I want to win. And it was a very tough race. And it's harder for women than it is for men. And it's harder for Latinas than it is for otherwise. Especially because of the amount of money you have to raise. It's so very difficult. So if there's one thing today I tell young people is build your network. Those people that you go to high school with, keep their information, become their friends, maintain those friendships. College, same thing. You never know where it will take you. And why is it so important that we're at the table? Because we need a voice. Look at the number of women you have in Congress today. It's 11 Latinas in Congress. That's just unacceptable, right? I happen to sit on Homeland Security. The wall that we're talking about that the president wants to do is coming to my committee. You can bet on one vocal person on this wall. <laughs> I 
And by the way, my mom, she has no idea what, what I do in Congress. <laughs> my mom has a third grade education. I show her the photos, and every time I'm in the paper, she'll go get 12 copies of it and say, like, mija, mina, right? <laughs> but it's, you know, for me, it's really an honor to serve the people of the 44th Congressional District. Uh, my story uh, for me is one I could never have really planned out. You know, sometimes we have these plans in life and we divert from the plans. Now, I'm very risk adverse, so I don't like to take big risks. I like to say I took a calculated risk and it paid off. And so I encourage every single one of you, whether you want to run or whether you have young people that you think are be great, <coughs> think about it. And it's okay to divert from the plan every now and again. Uh, but really investing in ourselves and our future, because we are the future of this country, and we need to have young people and young representation at the table so we can give a voice. We provide a very different perspective, both whether you're a woman, whether you're a Latina, whether you're an immigrant. It's all added value and diversity that we really need at the table. So thank you so much for hearing me out today. I look forward to meeting every single one of you. and reach out to our office and let us know how we can be of assistance. Don't let somebody to tell you to wait your turn. The time is now. Let's run. Thank you.